G'day and welcome to Not Q&A, the good sources alternative to acoustically treat the echo chamber, otherwise known as mainstream media. Very pleased to have your company. And tonight we are joined by Alexandra Marshall and James McPherson, regular good source commentators. Welcome to Not Q&A and thank you for joining me. Oi, Dave, I reckon you should open the show with that little musical number you just did for us earlier. Oh, really? Just uh, the little backstage thing? You know, you have to be a behind-the-scenes member actually supporting the good source to uh, get the behind-the-scenes studio embarrassment bloopers uh, as, as they happen. Uh, James, uh, are you happy to uh, sing for us on the show tonight? I don't think I could possibly do better than you just did, and I'm, I'm shocked that people actually pay to listen to that. Uh, oh, it's things. not that in particular. They, they, it's, it's like the it's like the voyeur experience, seeing how the sausage is made. Uh, uh, well, the fly, you, fly on the wall. The lesson you should have learned. The lesson you've learned from this is that you can't get away with anything while ever your co-hosts are here and listening. Uh, that's very true. Um, okay, so exciting night tonight. What we have uh, coming up, we have uh, Colin Tinknell, the leader of the One Nation Party in Western Australia. He's going to be joining us. We're going to be having a preview of the West Australia state election, which is coming up on Saturday, the 13th of March. And what you should be doing if uh, you are a resident of Perth and eligible, oh, not Perth, sorry, Western Australia, as well as Perth, uh, and if you're eligible to vote, and even if you're not eligible to vote, there's things you can do to help the best person get elected in your electorate and to the parliament. It's it's okay to hold a sign if you're not registered to vote um, and help other people uh, think about that. We'll talk about that and uh, which seats are the ones to be watched and uh, what the headline may be uh, on election night. We will be doing a uh, good source election night panel um, here and of course so you'll be able to watch that and we'll see if uh, the Labor government maintains not only government but uh, the balance of power in the Senate that will be very interesting to watch. We're also joined by Professor Augusto Zimmerman coming up and uh, we'll be talking about an article he's written about civil disobedience uh, quoting and referring to other works by other notable constitutional law professors in Australia and uh, some really great classical quotes on liberty as well. Uh, when is civil disobedience justified and how far can we go uh, in certain circumstances? But uh, very first of all, it's uh, good to welcome to the show tonight, um, Colin Tinknell, Member of Parliament. How are you, Colin? Yeah, very good. I'm very happy to be on the show. And if this was q and I, I wouldn't be on it. So thanks very much for inviting me. Um, my pleasure, and and thank you for coming on. We really appreciate whenever a politician takes time out of their busy schedule to face face the music. Uh, hopefully, we agree on a lot, but um, hopefully, we can persuade one another uh, civilly, if if and sincerely, if uh, there might be some differences of, of opinions. Because the goal of this show is to make voters better informed. Uh, I don't want everybody thinking like me. Because if I'm wrong, I need to think better and be better informed. And uh, I think if everybody's better informed, we'll end up with a better government because uh, we're getting it quite wrong quite often. So, Colin, what's the headline of the West Australian race at the moment here on the eastern coast? Um, we really don't hear much news coverage uh, about um, what's exactly happening in the West Australian race. Uh, I'm guessing Labor is likely to retain government over there, as is the case with incumbent governments most places around the world during um, this COVID uh, pandemic. Yeah, you've read it right. Um, the only the only other two uh, pandemic uh, sort of pandemic elections we've had is in Northern Territory and then just recently in Queensland. And if you're an incumbent member or incumbent government, there's a pretty good chance you'll hold your spot. But where people have been retiring, um, often there's been a change. So it's it's unusual. It's very unusual to sort of witness that going on with uh, the pandemic election. For us as a smaller party, um, we rate about the same size as the Greens in numbers that comes to the election in WA, which puts us, you know, either equal third um, to uh, Labor and Liberal. And then you have the Nationals who come in around about half of that about half of that percent because they only represented in the country areas where we're strong in both country and uh, uh, metro. So it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I think 
you're right, McGowan looks like he will get back in. And that's more because of people don't understand um, anything about this pandemic really at all. They think that uh, McGowan's a hero for keeping us all safe and locking down the borders. And yet all he's doing is following advice from the medical you know, people. And uh, yep. if you were the Premier at the time, you'd be crazy not to follow their advice. So he's not doing anything any special. Of course, Parliament gave him the ability to make those decisions and gave him extra powers during this pandemic. Now, some of us would be saying, well, maybe we trusted the wrong guy with those extra powers. But if you're in a war, um, you have to get behind your Premier and make sure that he's got the powers to do what he needs to do to keep everyone safe. Um, he's got those powers, but unfortunately he hasn't been keeping everyone informed about what he's doing. So sometimes we don't know whether it's medical advice or just he's using political um, decisions to make it easy for him and harder for everyone else. So that's well, where we're really at at the moment in general terms. It certainly does seem to be the case that uh, quite often these decisions seem to just be a, a, a thirst for power and, and have little medical or scientific evidence uh, behind it. Ellie, would it change, um, I guess, the acceptance of some of these uh, more seemingly ridiculous and arbitrary decisions if the science was transparent, if the modelling that they're basing uh, some of these panicking uh, moods that they're advising, um, if those models were transparent, we were able to see the assumptions um, that were putting in place to that. Is there, a, is there a case that the government, rather than saying trust the science, could build trust in the science with a little bit more communication and honesty? Well, you've got two problems with that theory. Um, as someone who designs complicated AI systems for a living, I can tell you they don't have anywhere near enough data to accurately model any of these things. Whether it's their climate change model, their COVID models, they simply don't know enough about the uh, moving parts in the system to predict basically anywhere in the future of how it will work. So they can't offer up that information because they simply don't have it. They're guessing and it's uh, their guess is that we are hinging our entire civilization future on. So that's pretty, that's, that's the first big problem they've got. The second is even if they could show their accurate modeling in a political system and in a, in a civilization, although something might be right technically and scientifically, it doesn't mean that it's the correct thing for the survival of the nation itself and for the more complicated parts of a nation. And so that's why we have this complicated balance between politicians and pressure groups and think tanks because sometimes what works for um, individual medical safety could destroy and throw a whole nation into poverty which causes even more problems so it's more complicated than just the science surrounding uh, COVID in particular you have to take these things in consideration with the greater economic uh, construct of what's going on otherwise we're going to end up like a third world nation and then COVID won't even be a problem because we'll have bigger things to solve. Yeah true. Colin is there a, uh, a solid chance that Labor is going to win government? And, and what's the likelihood for the upper house where you actually serve? You've, you've hit on a point. I, I just want to congratulate Ellie for her words because she, uh, she explained that things like this are not simple. They are very complicated. And uh, that's why probably uh, the, the, the fact that we operate under a, a democratic mon monarchy is probably a good thing because um, we have those checks and balances. Now, it means we're a little bit slower in making decisions. It's not so dynamic like, say, maybe the American or the French system. But um, if you look at Canada, New Zealand, Australia, um, very, very stable democracies, and we've served our citizens very well over a long, long time with no really <laughs> massive disasters. Um, it's not perfect, like I said. So I think very wise of her saying those things. In WA, the big picture now is the, uh, the upper house. Uh, unlike Queensland and New Zealand, we have an upper house. And thank God we do because uh, uh, Mark McGowan had a lot of power in the lower house and so things don't get debated. Uh, bills just go straight through. They come to the upper house in an absolute mess. And so we spend weeks sometimes just trying to get a very messy bill fixed up. And at other times, we reject that bill because there was no consultation, there was no debate, and it's a bad bill and it's going to serve uh, the electorate very poorly. 
if it's a bill that hasn't been taken to the election, something they've tried to squeeze through, just a, a quick money grab or whatever it may be, there's a pretty good chance that it's going to get it rejected. If it's a bill that they took to the election and that the electorate passed that and said, yes, this is what we want, then what we've got to do is try and fix up the bill because there's always unintended consequences. So in this election, if McGowan was to win the upper house, which Labor don't normally do, it will be a disaster for WA, and I don't think the public of WA understand that. Just like Ellie was saying, things are very complicated and unintended consequences is our job in the upper house. We make sure that uh, minority groups don't suffer a great deal because someone didn't think about them. Uh, you need to think about everything when you're passing bills, and we go through it painstakingly and we do the hard work, which the lower house doesn't get the opportunity anymore because it's just a lay down misere and it's been a majority there for quite a while, both when Barnett was in government and now McGowan's in government. So I think we're going to be faced with the same thing. The big thing here is will the Conservatives have a slight majority? And I say Conservatives, and I'm talking about in the last ele election, it was four different parties. We had mm. the Liberal Party, we had the Nationals, we had One Nation, and we had the Fishers and Shooters. Uh, and, of course, there was another one that slipped in, and very unusually, the Liberal Democrats also got a run. Mm. Um, Is he like all the same his seat? Sorry, what was that? Uh, the Liberal Democrat member, is he likely to retain his seat, do you think? Well, it's hard to know. He ran in the southern suburbs of Perth. There's a lot of people vying for that, including the Greens and us. But who knows? The last time he got up, it was uh, there was a bit of anomaly on the, the How to Vote card. In the, you know, there's that many people in the upper house that he, as the Liberal Democrats, uh, mm. it comes to a fold and Liberals stood up. Democrats was not clear. So people say he got in because of that. I'm not so sure. We'll, we'll see how he goes. Uh, we worked closely with him in the last four years, as we did with the shooter. And um, I got a feeling this time round, um, there won't be so many parties in the upper house. And to me, for democracy, that's a shame. Aaron Stonehouse is his name. My understanding is he's been uh, spending a lot of time dwelling on topics and fighting for policies in areas as things such as airsoft. Uh, is that correct? Yes, he has. I think he has little um, favourite little projects. And sometimes when you're talking about major things that are going to affect uh, the very important things about, you know, unemployment and health and education, then I would say, well, Aaron, can we spend our time on more important things? However, um, this is important to a Liberal Democrat, so we gave him a little bit of what he wanted and we made sure that he supported us when we had major bills going through um, from a conservative point of view. I mean, I, we're very strong in a social sense, One Nation, very, very strong uh, with the environment. I think that surprises people. But this is One Nation That's WA. Conservatives are. Yeah, well, I think it surprises. We, we believe in a sustainable approach to business and that includes the environment. Um, and that's our credentials. That's who we are in West Australia. And um, we're quite a bit different to the federal party, which have to worry about immigration and other issues. We, we worry about what immigration may do to a state, like we'll need extra hospitals, schools, you name it. That's where we come in and make sure that this government is protecting the people of WA and providing those facilities. Yep. Can I ask a question? Please. Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. So are you worried about what happened to One Nation in the previous Queensland election, given that it was also a COVID election and the politics of WA regarding the way they handled COVID is quite similar to the approach McGowan's taken, although he did include ankle bracelets, which was a step above Palaszczuk. Uh, <laughs> and also, what is your main point of difference that you're selling the electorate over in WA that differs perhaps from either the Conservatives or from Labor? Because that's what people complained about in the uh, Queensland election, that nobody other than Labor was actually producing a coherent point about what they're going to do regarding the state. So, yeah, that's my two questions for you. Yeah, no, thank you. They're good questions. I think the best way to answer that is we've basically been black banned by the major media. Hence, I'm on this show tonight. I mean, it is very, very hard to get on TV. Other than Sky TV, it's virtually Channel 7, Channel 9, ABC, 
maybe the ABC regional give us a bit of a run sometimes in the country. So we have to get our views across through social media, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, and, and shows and blogs like this and Sky TV who give us a run, uh, but they give everyone a run. Um, so, yes, it is very hard. I'm sure Pauline mentioned that during this Queensland election. It was very hard to get any breakthrough from the media. So we require our members and our supporters to have a look at our Facebook page, have a look at our social media to get the information out there. Unfortunately, that's the way it's gone. When it comes to big business in this state, you may have heard about a property developer called Nigel Satterley, basically admitting that he basically owns the Labor Party or when he favours, he, he'll own the Liberal Party. It was very embarrassing. He had an interview on uh, live radio just the other day and it just showed how bad it's got over here when it comes to big parties budding up either with unions or big business. One Nation will never do that. We're not interested in those sort of relationships. If someone wants to support us, it's about getting extra members in, nothing to do with the policies we pass in, a, in an election or even in a, in, in a when we're in government. So, look, to answer your question, yes, I'm worried about what happened in New Zealand. Um, sorry, um, <laughs> other elections. Everyone's um, worried about New Zealand. <laughs> but um, XR, you know, WA is a bit different to Queensland. Um, we've never had a far right. Well, we've never had a far right uh, premier like uh, Bielke Peterson. Um, there's never been probably a strong character like Pauline in WA. Um, we, we tend to be we position ourselves between Liberal and Labor, and we've done that because that's where the growth is. That's where when Liberal and Labor aren't performing, we pick up a lot of those people to join our already core group of people. And we always rate somewhere, but when we're having a bad election, somewhere around about 8%, when we're having a good election, it gets up towards 12. I'm talking statewide. Mm. Um, in some pockets in the last federal election, we got as high as 18, 20%. Places like Collie, which is the coal heartland of um, WA. And I don't think people realise that we get more Labor people now move over to us than we do Liberal people. Yeah. And that's because of where we positioned ourselves. Aspirational workers come to us because they don't believe the Labor Party represents them anymore. Yeah. So I think the, most, the main important area for us, the, the point of difference, is that we represent the, the silent majority of people. We it's, don't uh, represent uh, major many. minority groups who are already getting great representation from the major parties and the Greens. I can confirm what you're saying about the uh, the appeal to the Labor voters. When I was on uh, the state executive of Family First here in Queensland, um, we noticed that we were getting a lot of our preferential flow from people um, who were Labor voters. They would vote one for yes. Family First and then two for Labor. Uh, and, I mean, that was hard to explain from us because we were a very, uh, very conservative uh, party. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it might have been as much as a third sometimes in some elections were going on from their family first vote to, to vote for um, Labor. We have a question. I, I can just mention the, the major point of difference, as Ellie said, um, we're standing up to Mark. Mark's doing a pretty bad job in everything else. Um, medical, in, we just had deaths in Bunbury Hospital. Um, mm. The government was warned about these problems. Uh, 12 months ago, did nothing about it. With homelessness going through the roof, we put a plan to the government two years ago, uh, a, a program that works very well all over the world and actually in New South Wales, um, in uh, Newcastle, and yet this government still are doing nothing about it. So we're actually standing up to Mark and acting as the opposition, which um, makes it hard because I don't get the coverage from the main media. But um, there are many things just like that I could go on for hours about all the different things that we're talking about, yet everyone's talking COVID and uh, really it's pretty boring now. Um, everyone understands that COVID's important. That doesn't mean all the other things aren't either. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question here from Dion Brunette. Um, I think it's for uh, you, Colin. Uh, what's your views on forced vaccination? So that's not a question about uh, vaccination. In general. Very happy to answer that. Yeah, um, I'm a pro-choice guy and so is One Nation, right across the nation. Pauline spoke about that four years ago, the last WA election. She's a pro-choice. 
if you're if you want to have a vaccination or you're thinking about having a vaccination, go and speak to your doctor. Make sure it's right for you. Make sure that that vaccination's been checked out. And there's very, very, very little chance because there's never no chance that something won't go wrong. Um, I've I've had vaccinations all my life, and so is Pauline, and so is my kids and her kids and many other people in our party. But we have people in our party, just like every party, that are very scared about vaccination. You have to respect their choice. It's their health. They make their decision with their professional doctor who they know and trust. They don't need Alan Joyce telling them whether they should have a vaccination or not, you know, from Qantas. They don't need anyone telling them because they won't be there when that vaccination may go wrong. So it is a personal decision which should be made by the person themselves. We're not for mandatory vaccine anywhere, but we aren't anti-vax. I want to make that clear. We are not anti-vax. I will probably have the vaccination. I'm happy to put that on record. I have a health condition, and at my age, it may be the smartest move I can make. But for other people, it may be the worst move they'd make. It's up to them to talk to their professional doctor who knows them better than anyone else to make that decision. No one yep. else yep. Could, should be telling you what to do with your own body. Sure, I, I agree. There should be no um, compulsion. You're a braver man than me, though. I won't be volunteering. Um, what I do want to ask you about is this um, topic, uh, and that is uh, the call from Pauline Hansen to ban um, Nazi yes, I was interested. <laughs> symbols. Now, it comes after this clown here, uh, pictured on, on screen, uh, wore a swastika armband when he was uh, out shopping at the Melbourne market at the weekend, complete with uh, his uh, greasy long hair in a ponytail and uh, looks like some kind of trench coat or something. Uh, he may have emerged from his uh, mother's basement um, to go and buy some Coke or something. But uh, is this guy, I mean, other than being an obvious loser, um, is this necessary, banning um, a swastika? What, what are your direct on me? Yeah, look... Um, I, um, as everyone knows, um, I'm not old enough to remember the war, but I know my parents um, and very, very hard to get any questions and answers from mum and dad and many other parents of, of that generation. My parents are now past. Uh, and because it was such a bad time, my dad was stationed in um, Iraq, uh, Kuwait and Palestine, as it was then called. And uh, he wouldn't talk about it. He wouldn't talk about it. He wouldn't talk about the war because it was incredibly bad period people think this is pandemic is bad i mean we i understand we've lost a lot of people but it's a, it's a virus it's a completely different situation what we have in had in nazi germany was complete brainwashing of the public uh, this guy was going to give them everything they want and they loved him and they let him get away with uh, enormous atrocities to not just jewish people but people right across the globe and um, so when you see a Nazi swastika, I'm just as abhorred as anyone. I hate them. I, I I think people that wear that sort of stuff have got something wrong. There, there must be weirdos or something wrong in their head. But do I believe in banning things? No. I don't believe in just outright bans of things. I'm, I'm a believe in um, we need these things to remind the new, the new generation how bad it can be if you allow a dictator to just con you into whatever thought process they want you to think about. That's what Stalin did, what Mao did, and it's what yeah. Hitler did. So this, all uh, of those symbols yeah, new can ideas. be bad, but I don't know about being completely banned. This person here says, don't Nazis have a right to free speech? What are your thoughts, James McPherson? Uh, Well, of course, Nazis have a right to free speech. The moment you start saying certain groups don't have a right to free speech, you set yourself up to be the next group that doesn't have a right to free speech. So, look, I I think you've proved the point tonight. You don't know this guy, but you made fun of his greasy hair, you made fun of him living in his mum's basement, and you made fun of him being a loser, all based on the fact he was wearing a Nazi symbol. So I think that uh, society works pretty well. You wear a symbol like that and the court of public opinion will pretty soon shut you down. We don't need more laws shutting people down. We've got enough of those already. We shouldn't ban any symbols. 
Uh, we should allow the expression of ideas and then we should allow the better ideas to rise to the top. That's the great thing about our country and I'm pleased to hear Colin uh, promote that. Yeah, look, I'm 100% I'm behind what you say. I mean, when you think about exactly what Hitler did, he demonised the, the Jews. I mean, how ridiculous was that? Yeah, they had a lot of power and they had all the money and all of that sort of stuff, but that's what they do. And, and were we going to demonise someone because they're wearing a swastika? No. We can allow the public opinion, like you said, to show that they aren't really great people and they'll usually uh, dig their own grave, if you like. That's the way I would say. But you're right. If we live in a free society, all ideas should be debated. And, uh, you know, hopefully the public will uh, make sure that the abhorrent ideas get sent to the, the trash can where they belong. This is one thing, um, uh, Dave, that conservatives need to be very careful of. We, we are the first to criticise cancel culture. Well, we can't have it both ways. We, we can't be on the one hand criticising cancel culture and then when there's something we don't like, be the first ones to jump up and, and say, ban it, cancel it. So if, if you're going to be against cancel culture, then you've got to be against it, no matter who the offending person might be. Yeah. Uh, one of everybody's uh, favourite Twitter um, commentators, Evelyn Ray, he says, the absence of objectivity and debate is the language of the oppressor. 100% true. It's, uh, it's such, it's like, it's like diagnosing a leftist, the absence of objectivity and debate, the, the two things they're allergic to. The, the problem with that tweet, Dave, is that the language has been so hijacked. When she says it's the language of the oppressor, does she mean white heterosexual men? <laughs> That's right. No, the actual oppressor. Oh, okay. the, uh, not, what, not about, the what about undercover. stale, pale, grey old males like me? <laughs> We've been demonised. I mean, is that, is that what we're going to do next? Um, that's what Hitler did to the Jews. Are we going to do that to us old bastards? I mean, I don't know whether, you know, that's what you, you're 100% right. Um, no, everyone has a point of view. Everyone, freedom is freedom. Uh, yep. We fought so long and hard to get people that freedom. And what we're going to now just chuck it out because we don't agree with someone. Yeah. I um, what look my my last comment on this before we introduce uh, a fellow Western Australian uh, to you, Colin. Before we let you go, um, is I don't know how anybody can wear a swastika in public and not be absolutely humiliated. I don't know how you walk out the front door um, just you know blushing with with absolute embarrassment. And yet, I think the same thing of everybody who wears a Che Guevara T-shirt or a hammer and and sickle. Um, icon. They are just as much symbols of murderous, uh, genocidal, um, un complete lawful, lawless, lawless barbarism. Um, just genocide and racism, and and the worst kind of ideologies to run a government on. And yet, there's no hesitation at all in wearing the symbols of of failed murderous socialist regimes. Uh, on on apparel around, and uh, they should at the very least be in the same class, whether banned or not is is a is another question. But I, I don't know how anybody wear those wears those things. And, and Dave, I think, I think you've got to add to that list people who wear Crocs. Crocs. <laughs> Uh, look, this is interesting. Uh, look, I'm going to bring in Augusto Zimmerman here, and we will then go to Luke Bailey's comment. Uh, Augusta, just unmute yourself and uh, we welcome Alexandra Marshall back to the stream as well. Uh, um, I had a total failure, by the way. So I'm on a completely different camera. My phone wigged out. So can I, Can you guys see me? Because I can't look at the screen and you at the same time because my camera is yes. now not where my computer is. It's all we good. It's a closed picture. <sighs> now, um, okay. uh, Augusto, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, these distinguished guests. Now, Luke Bailey says that uh, he doesn't believe free speech is a God-given right. When God rules in a theocracy, people will be punished severely for spouting out demonic ideas. I believe there will be laws set up to punish this, I believe. Well, um, let's... Probably a lot of that is conjecture, uh, but the first sentence, I don't believe free speech is a God-given right. Um James, your thoughts on that? 
Well, it depends entirely upon which God you're talking about, doesn't it? Um, the one true God. If you read the Quran, uh, no discussion shall be entered into. But if you read the Bible uh, with the Christian God, uh, it's amazing how often the heroes of the Bible disagreed with God, argued with God, uh, accused God. So, so to say that God doesn't uh, grant free speech is really just to confess that you've not read the Bible at all. Mm -hmm. Fair point. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think the Garden of Eden pretty well established that God was all up for uh, people doing the wrong thing um, if they so choose to abuse freedom that way. No, um, one, of the, one of the great scriptures in the book of Isaiah, and uh, and God says to the prophet Isaiah, "Come, let us reason together," which is oh, an amazing yeah. thing that the Creator of the universe would condescend to humanity, fallen humanity, and say, "Hey, let's talk this through together." And, and when you're talking of the Christian God, that's the kind of God that you're talking about, which is why we have the society we have where we're supposed to say, hey, come, let's, let's reason this through together and arrive at wisdom. And the more that we uh, depart from our Judeo-Christian ethic, the less we see that uh, principle of let's come together and, and reason these things through. So I, I think we're seeing the departure from Christian principles in our political discourse. Well, pivoting right to another major transgression of freedoms. Does in the atheist not get a comment on that conversation? Uh, can, hmm. can we come back to it? I, I just want to let uh, Colin go. Sure. Um, but uh, feel free to come back to that. Um, I will. And, uh, yeah, absolutely uh, you can. But uh, I'm just aware of Colin's time, and I want to talk about another major issue in Perth and get Colin's take on it. Um, before we, we let him go for the evening. Um, and Augusto will be sticking around. Um, and this is an article by Professor Augusto Zimmerman, uh, Disobeying Draconian Directives on Cicil, uh, Civil Disobedience and COVID-19 Directives. Uh, and uh, Augusto, why don't you summarise that um, article for us? I won't read it because it would, it would take 10 minutes at least. Well, this is uh, uh, an article based uh, on a book written by my great friend, Emeritus Professor Gabe Jones, uh, he was um, the dean of the law school at Murdoch in the good old days of Murdoch University when the law school was a, an excellent uh, institution here in Western Australia. And he uh, uh, decided to uh, collect uh, some of his favorite papers that he wrote over a period of about 40 years. Ended up publishing this book here, Enduring Ideas. And uh, I actually uh, just referred to two articles in this book. One is on the rights of uh, civil disobedience when it is a necessary thing to do according to the law. One thing that you have to bear in mind is that Professor Moises wrote this from uh, the perspective of a law professor. He's not advocating that we should behave in a lawless way but it's in accordance with the rule of law. But unfortunately, if the government acts tyrannically and violates fundamental principles of our common law tradition and constitutional government, we have a lawful right to resist. That's the point that he made. It's extremely valid because it's in accordance with our common law tradition and the tradition of constitutional government. The other article that he wrote in conjunction with this is about uh, the COVID measures. So I was just um, connecting both articles, but not necessarily promoting the idea that we should go on disobeying directives when they are reasonable and made in accordance with the law. So my point in the article is that there are some uh, occasions in which the citizen has to uh, have a consideration for fundamental rights and freedoms that are important to be preserved and must be uh, preserved at all costs if necessary, because we fought tyrannical regimes in the past. And one of my main concerns with what's happening at this present moment is that emergency powers and extraordinary measures can somehow become permanent. 
And when it become, becomes mm. permanent, we will be unable to have the restoration of the constitutional order that existed prior to the emergency. We had the same situation uh, happening in the past, including in Europe in the 1930s. What I'm going to say here very clearly is that normally authoritarian regimes always appeal to emergency. Uh, the point is that the powers tend to not be restored and devolved to the people. So the price of liberty is a turn of vigilance, and you have to be more vigilant than ever. And that's yep. the message that I put in this article. Colin, uh, Mark McGowan has uh, certainly been very strict, uh, and maybe he's been using his chief medical officer as a scapegoat for the decisions his government has been making. But to what extent should West Australians be concerned about the precedents being set right now? And, uh, and is civil disobedience something that you think is uh, on the horizon of being considered necessary response to the excesses of those health directives? Yeah, look, it's uh, very, very good that Augusto's mentioned that. It's, um, we had a problem. You may remember when uh, I, Palmer was sort of the most hated person in WA because he was challenging Mark McGowan and all of this. And then what he actually did was was able to convince many members of parliament to pass a bill which was cancelling a contract that Clive had with the government, a state agreement that they passed, a Labor government passed, back about 20-odd years ago. Uh, it was a funny thing is uh, One Nation voted against that state agreement back then. And once again, we voted against the government and the opposition because they went and passed the bill just because Clive's an unlike person in WA. Not a great reason to um, cancel a contract. If the government gets the contract right, they pay the price uh, and they, they, you know, they deal their way out of it uh, through the courts. But they decided to change laws in Parliament, which was uh, despicable behaviour. Once again, um, Augusto mentioned that the internal vigilance. Uh, we were the WA Parliament was let down really bad. There was only uh, young Aaron Stonehouse, uh, One Nation, and I believe Rick Mazza that stood up uh, to be counted in that. That was the crossbench. Um, so once again, you know, if you go back to the Vietnam War days, uh, we may find that now that they were correct, that um, in the Vietnam War days, um, those things, the people were right. They, they were correct that it was a very bad war. But like Augusto mentioned, um, it doesn't mean you can go out there and just break the law to get your point across. You need to do it properly. Mm. Um, mm. We have we have provisions in our laws to protect people to be able to go out there and protest in a civil disobedient way, but not breaking the laws of the land. The thing that makes Australia, New Zealand, Canada, these countries so great is our, our rule of law and we won't allow people to break that, just get away with it and not pay a penalty. The rule of law keeps us all safe. Any thoughts, James or Ellie? Yeah. Um, the Whether or not it's right for people to break the rule of law in a form of civil disobedience is a moot point really because if laws are so unpopular or uh, unenforceable, then they will be broken by the population regardless of whether it's a good idea or not because that is how civilization protests bad law. So although good law should be obeyed, sometimes we end up in the position where governments pass laws that are bad for society and bad for civilization, and often they pass laws that are not uh, they have not been through the proper process before they were passed, such as many of these medical mandates, which if they were actually put to a vote would be uh, rejected and, and thrown out. So it's a very tricky question, but basically politicians can't do anything about it. The civilization, like the people will protest and break the law if they are bad laws. And the trick for government is not to create laws that are either unenforceable or unlawful in themselves. And that solves your problem of civil disobedience. Yeah. Augusto, have you got any further thoughts? No, it's very important. Uh, Ali explained this, uh, put this in a way that uh, would shame a law professor. 
I mean, some law professors actually have a poorer knowledge of the rule of law than, than, than she has just demonstrated to have. Uh, the rule of law is very much uh, uh, an idea of legality. It's not just to have laws. Laws, China, North Korea, they, they all have laws. Uh, to have the rule of law is more than that. It's more than just having laws. Uh, it's based on a tradition in which the law serves the purpose of protecting what we used to call in the past inalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and property. And if you see the tradition in the West and what it has done, uh, Aquinas, for instance, would make it very clear that a bad law is actually a crooked law. We can call bad law law, but as a matter of fact, it, not, it is not serving the purpose of the rule of law, which is to be protecting citizens against oppression and tyranny. So yeah. governments that use the law as an instrument of oppression are not respecting our tradition based on the rule of law. So the rule of law is a tradition that must be taken into account, respected, and as I said, it's something that um, one generation can put everything to lose if we do not, uh, if you're not uh, vigilant enough. Societies uh, can degenerate into chaos very quickly if they don't pay enough attention to the behavior of the authorities. We mm. have to be very careful to avoid the a situation that I have seen in many other countries that can be a situation where a democracy degenerates into a state of chaos and anarchy. We don't want this to be happening in this country. Indeed. Uh, Colin, any final thoughts uh, from you before we let you go tonight? Thank you very much for your generosity with your time. No, it's great to be invited. It's great to be with these panellists. It's uh, been a great conversation and I appreciate it. I wanted to let you know, you did ask me to give a bit of an analysis quickly on the election. I'll do that pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, we you. believe that we can win, um, One Nation believes we can win five seats in the upper house. There's six going up in the in the, um, in the the upper house. So we think we can win five. Um, wow. Last election we won three, but we, we were organized within three months last time. This time we've had four years, we've got five candidates running right across both upper house and lower house. So we're well prepared for this election. Uh, we are we, ha we are copying it from the media, not getting any play whatsoever. But that's fine. Our, um, our One Nation supporters generally know what goes on with them. So they will um, they'll come out of their numbers and support us. We have many volunteers. And in the lower house, um, there are about five or six seats the Liberals can't afford to lose. Kingsley and... Um, uh, Hillary's in the northern suburbs. Uh, they're going to be borderline. We have got a candidate in Kingsley. Um, in the eastern suburbs, Darling Range. In the southern suburbs, you've got places like Riverton. So there are there are many seats in the metro area. And then you've got in the country area, which I'm probably more concerned about, because that's where our strength is, Kalgoorlie, uh, Geraldton, um, Collie, Albany. They are just seats that um, are up for grabs. There's retiring members, the Conservatives are going to put up a pretty big fight against Labor in those seats. So I don't know how it's going to work out. I would imagine Labor will get in. They'll get in on Greens' preferences like they did the last election. People think they had a landslide. They actually won 26 seats. You need 30 to form the government. And the Greens got them in by another, well, they built their, their, their numbers up to 41 seats through okay. Greens' preferences. Okay. So you can see the Labor Party aren't as strong as they make out. They only survive on Green preferences. Where on the Conservative side... Mind you, uh, it is a strong debate. Green and green it's not as clear as vote, What was that, sorry? It is a strong showing for the left of centre vote. I mean, it, there, there's, it's like, uh, I guess, Labor voters and radical Labor voters is another way of thinking of Greens voters. Yeah, and you see that um, just before every election, Mark or the Labor Party really uh, put out a whole lot of policies that are going to appeal to the Greens uh, just before the election to make sure they get their preferences. And then once they form government, they usually forget about the Greens and just get on with business. A bit like Scott Morrison did to the quiet Australians after the last federal election. He just sold them down the, 
uh, down the drain and uh, just gone about his business. He's looking more and more like Turnbull every day. Yeah. Yeah, look, uh, the the Liberal Party's in a real mess in Western Australia. Their leader is worse than Malcolm Turnbull um, as far as uh, conservative credentials go. Uh, I don't know what the party is thinking there. There's many I good um, many good candidates and, and members of the Liberal Party, uh, but I don't know what is happening to the party that they thought that was their leader. Uh, remarkable. Yeah, and you don't you can't blame Zach for that. Zach's a first time politician. He's a young man. He's having a go. He, his politics may not be what like conservatives like, but the facts are he was thrown into that role. So it's not his fault that he's there. It is the party leadership. They've got a lot of things wrong with themselves. They don't work with the other conservatives very well against the uh, socialists. I just don't understand what they're up to at this moment. They look like they're they're ready to self destruct, and that's why One Nation is basically acting as the opposition in WA. I know that's hard to say because we don't have any lower house members. Mm. But we did have shared balance of power last four years, and we're hoping that we get the balance of power in our own right this time around. Yeah. Well, somebody who's so illiberal uh, as as Zach is um, a, a terrible reflection on the party. And, look, what that means is more people should be joining the parties to help better people get pre-selected. And, and you know, the, the party needs to change from the grassroots up. But... Um, uh, yeah. my, my encouragement is to find good people. Uh, you know, we're hoping that we we certainly get a chance to to get to know you, Colin, and and some of your colleagues and and some of your competitors, uh, so, because we want to encourage people to approach every election undecided and genuinely compare the candidates on their credentials, on their values, on their policies, and uh, no let's let let's see. I want, what to say, I want to say on leaving. I want to just say thank you to my fellow MP. Robin Scott, he's been a tower of strength this past four years. Our politics is similar. We may not agree on everything, but um, he's been a tower of strength. And to our president, Rod Caddies, who will be running in the agricultural region, he's done a great job of pulling the party together at a very, because uh, we have, we we changed our party leadership about a year ago. He's done a great job of pulling that together. And um, we've got a great team now, and I wish everyone all the best in, in this election. And I want Thanks hope that democracy time. wins out 100%. Thanks for your time tonight, Colin. We'll Thanks. talk to you again uh, either before the election or maybe on election night. Thank you very much and all the best to you, Augusto. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Good to see you too. All the best in this election. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. And that's Colin Tinknell, leader of uh, One Nation Party in Western Australia, member of the Upper House, hoping to increase their representation there. My encouragement to West Australians would be don't give Labor the balance of power in the Upper House. Find anybody mm. right of Stalin and uh, hold Mark McGowan to account. Um, well, but can I say something about this? Uh, that's why we are having this problem now with the leader of the opposition. We have some excellent people in the Liberal Party who deserve our support, but um, the, they chose, the, the choice that was made for the leader is absolutely disastrous, I can tell you. Uh, mm -hmm. He seems to be a cheerleader of the government, and whatever the government does, he enthusiastically agrees with. So I, I think there is a total lack of a, of a real opposition now, Another thing I have to say is that the treatment envisaged on one of their, their candidates was appalling, in my opinion, when that poor lady, Andrea Tokaji, was expelled, basically, from the party, disendorsed uh, on the basis of a comment made uh, more than one year, about one year ago. Uh, this lady is a, a refugee. Uh, she, the family came from Romania, and she's a human rights advocate. She has been doing a, such a wonderful job for the community here, uh, a woman who has uh, great uh, uh, assets to present to the electorate, a woman who advocates for human rights and freedoms, including free speech, was treated in the worst possible manner. Uh, I mean, this is like a Stalinist approach of killing and executing a person. Well, she um, wrote an article talking about um, uh, COVID. Most of what she said was excellent. 
there was one point there that I thought was not all that good. One single paragraph was enough for her to be executed. So nobody paid attention in the remaining of the article. The great points that she made uh, she is very articulate, and the community in Baldives is loving her. Uh, and what, what the they she was did in that problem paragraph. The the problem was that she referred to technology being perhaps uh, influencing the spread of the virus. That um, theory of uh, G five. She changed her mind. She says that this is an article she wrote when this whole thing was just starting and that she would not write the same. I have to say that this is a sign of humility. A person has the right to change her mind and has yeah. the right to evolve their ideas. Yeah. What we can't have is a liberal party that that treats people in such a terrible manner, yeah. uh, really, really vilifying this person and trying to destroy her image and her reputation. I'm not going to be silent about this because for me it was a, a dictatorial act. They didn't have, they didn't give her the dignity to have a right to say on this subject or the principles of natural justice and due process were respected. Basically, she was not uh, given the chance to explain. Yep. Well, before we get into a deeper conversation on civil liberties, Alexandra, do you remember what it was that you wanted to say on the previous conversation? Uh, I think it might have been about free speech. Do I remember? Of course I remember, Dave. <laughs> um, but also, just on that previous point, if we sacked every politician who was wrong, we would have no politicians. That would That's just yeah. a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. we were talking okay. about... We were talking about God-given rights, and I believe the person who asked the question said that in a theocracy, the God-given rights to things like free speech are not God-given rights because the God or the text that the rules are defined from limit the rights that people have. But when we're talking about God-given rights in the uh, the Westminster sense, the English liberty from which we get our political systems, we use God as a legal figure. It's the same kind of uh, act of God that we talk about when a tree falls down. We're not talking about a text giving people rights. We're talking about the inalienable rights of being a human, the rights that we are born with. And the discussion about uh, what is and is not a human right is something that humanity has not been able to answer in a satisfactory manner across the whole globe, which is why the UN has had to develop subsections of human rights to deal with Islamic cultures who do not agree with the human rights that are written in the UN Human Rights Charter. So it, all I want to say was that we don't actually live in a theocracy, we are talking about uh, the God-given right as a legal term of our inalienable human right and what society has decided is a right that all humans should have upon birth and it's not something that the government gives to you or that can take away. Yep. Uh, James, I'm aware your time's uh, limited also this evening. You got any thoughts on, on this topic? Uh, I know Augusto does and I know I do. We, we think very similarly about the origin of natural law, but... Um, James, uh, your thoughts on what Ali just said? Yeah, well, you know, we only addressed the first part of that um, message. Uh, mm. As for a theocracy, well, the, the Bible doesn't teach a theocracy, um, at least not this side of Christ. <laughs> so that's a bit of a moot point. My problem, um, Ali, with uh, you talking about rights that you were born with uh, presupposes that someone somewhere must have granted those rights so no it doesn't no it doesn't well then we are then saying what... that, that a system of government doesn't that we give systems of governments the ability to give and take rights and what we're saying is as a civilization and a political system we decide that governments should not have the ability to give or take some rights so it was a conscious decision made by humans who created the political system a lot of that was done i think it was 11th or 12th century i wonder if i can rephrase that and if you would say I'm agreeing with you. Um, I don't think governments have the... Uh, there are some rights governments don't have the ability to either grant or deny, such as the right to life. That's not a government's right to grant or deny. It's inherent to our nature. It's inherent to our existence. Uh, and there are other such rights like that uh, that are fundamental fundamental, the, the right of, of freedom, the right to not be enslaved. That's a fundamental human right. Um, there's no popular consensus which would legitimise uh, 
a, the legalization or liberalization of slavery. It just, that would be a, a fraud. And, and that is, I, I, know, I know enough of my um, English jurisprudence to, to know that that is definitely uh, one of the hallmarks of, of our legal traditions is, is to say that, that Ill, there is such a thing as illegitimate laws made by governments um, and governments, they're illegitimate because governments cannot be given the power to to make or, or to make those laws or, or break those freedoms. Um, they got basically saying that if you remove God from the picture, on what basis do you say that anything is a human right? Um, all your left. Well, yes, which is the state, which is the state. So everything is up for grabs, and everything becomes a matter of personal preference or opinion, and the strongest person wins. So all I'm saying is, if you abandon belief in God, you have no basis for human rights except whoever's in power. That's not true at all. Can I say something about it? Uh, look, I, I wrote a trilogy on the subject, uh, yeah. uh, the Christian Foundations of the Common Law, and the first volume is on England. Uh, now we obviously know that um, most of the members of the legal profession don't even know legal history to start with, and they probably have no faith in God whatsoever. But that's problematic because the first of all, um, held the idea that um, there were what we would call uh, natural law and the law of reason. And if you go to the first uh, comprehensive treatise on the common law, it was it's written by a clergyman. And uh, most of the greatest common lawyers were uh, connected with the church. Uh, Cook is a good example. Bracton, uh, the celebrated Bracton in the 13th century, is responsible for that famous statement that the king is under God and the law because the law makes him king. Uh, that is uh, an important uh, uh, statement because it was repeated by Cook when he was um, challenging the authority arbitrary authority of James I. But if you read the Legitibus Constitutibus Anglia of Bracto, uh, he gives the example of Jesus Christ and he says that Christ came first to create the law of liberty, but it, liberty is a very important element in our common law tradition derived from this biblical tradition. Another thing is that he says that Jesus came to fulfill the law and not to repeal the law, meaning that even the Son of God decided to be under the law. If, if the king of the kings, according to Christianity, is under the law, who is... Uh, uh, um, a person capable of doing more than him, nobody. And that was a very compelling argument. It worked perfectly well for the development of the rule of law in England when the society was um, comprised of Christian people. So I can tell you that even though we still have this understanding of rights and freedoms, there is no doubt that the common lawyers, according to the common law tradition, the likes of William Blackstone, the likes of John Fortescue and Cook uh, ultimately appealed to the authority of Scripture in order to reveal that the purpose of the law is to be an instrument of liberty. And the government that defies this idea is acting in a tyrannical fashion. The purpose of the rule of law is to liberate people from oppression. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think... Uh if even if a secular government acknowledged they were not the final authority and there was an authority higher than them uh, which they had to cooperate with, um, we would still have a sufficient level of humility in parliament and, and governments to avoid some of the authoritarian messes that particularly the 20th century resulted in, but even this last year where people in power mid-level bureaucrats with a, a single a single specialty and unelected otherwise uh, have trampled all over inherent freedoms for the flimsiest of reasons with zero evidence or, or scientific rationale for it. Can I make one small point about that very interesting discussion that was just on there? I'll be very brief. Sure. Uh, liberty is not a concept that belongs to 
Europeans or the Christian religion. It is a, an idea that humans express in various formats throughout history and throughout the world. But if we're going to go back to English liberty, one of the most interesting things about the development of liberty as a legal construct is that it really got going when we had a conflict between the church, the monarchy, and the rise of other institutions like the scientific method and things like that. When these things, and also personal liberty, and when these things started interacting, it caused uh, an upheaval of conflict about how to get freedom from oppressive systems, whatever they were. And this developed many of the checks and balances that went into the law to give individual liberty and, and freedom to certain institutions. And that's when we really started to get into things like freedom of speech, which did not really exist in a proper sense before that time. Yeah, I think, uh, Augusta, you'd agree that um, it, it's, it, was a concept, it was a concept in, uh, I don't know if ancient is the right word, but if you'll forgive me for referring to Blackstone and his colleagues and, as ancient, uh, it, it's an old um, understanding that law is something that's discovered. It's not something they thought they had a complete grasp on, but it was something... Yes. It was something that they didn't create, but it was something that they discovered, much as, as what Ellie is describing, that we, we've had an evolution of freedom um, given, given that concept that law is discovered, not made. Certainly so. And the whole idea that um, God being a God of freedom would uh, allow every single human being to make choices, including regarding to salvation. Mm. Uh, the idea of checks and balances is very, is very important because... Uh, now we don't know, but if you read Montesquieu, for instance, he has even a whole chapter in total acknowledgement of the contribution of Christianity to this tradition of checks and balances. He compares, for instance, with Islam, Christianity and Islam. Uh, the point is that people don't read Montesquieu, and they have no idea what Montesquieu says, but he was a committed Christian in his own way, and Locke is more important even, because Locke um, didn't write only the second treatise. He wrote the first treatise as well. And his appeal uh, in, is to God, ultimately. Think about this idea of natural law. He believed that the natural law is actually conceived and created by a benevolent law that creates the law as derived from the nature of things. That makes God not arbitrary. And a government that violates these rights that are trans transcendental, and these rights are inalienable because they are not state-given. So there is no idolatry or worship of government in this sense. And the one thing that is happening now in the West is that we are turning government into a deity. And you think the God, the, the God of the society is the state. The state gives, the state takes away. Blessed be the name of this day. That's not <laughs> going to bode well. Yeah. Let's have a look at this quote from Locke that you've included in your article. Uh, you, you say, Locke's anthropology was built upon his Christian views and such views are essential to his substantial contributions in legal political theory, according to Locke. Quote, whenever the legislators endeavour to take away and destroy the rights of the people, it's like he's talking about 2020, or to reduce them to slavery under arbitrary power, they put themselves into a state of war with the people who are thereupon absolved from any further obedience and are left to the common refuge which God hath provided for all men against force and violence. Yes, look, this is, uh, you have to understand that uh, even though we now think that classical liberal theory created the idea of a social contract. The idea of social contract is actually even uh, prior to the development of classical liberal theory. You think about uh, the likes of um, the Spaniards, uh, who were natural lawyers, they actually had a very good develop, de developed theory of social contract. Aristotle had an idea, but especially uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. And that's the idea that even the government subject to to the law. The Magna Carta is a good example because it was written by an archbishop, the Archbishop of England, uh, of Canterbury, uh, Stephen Langton. And the whole idea of Langton was to create a written constitution that would subject the 
the king to certain limitations of power. The first clause in the Magna Carta was the protection of the church as an institution. So the document was a, a, a document uh, produced by the church of the day. What I have to say regarding social contract is that the government then is based on the hierarchy of laws. And the law of the state is at the bottom of this hierarchy. There is a whole higher jurisprudence which dictates that certain things that the government uh, uh, attempts to do violates the social contract and therefore people have a lawful right to resist such acts of tyranny. Uh, if, if we believe that the positive law of the state, we call positive law, is not the ultimate law of the land, this law can be challenged by lawful means, and that's exactly what the American revolutionaries did with their declaration of independence. They appealed to a higher law jurisprudence. Let's uh, have another look at a quote from your article, and I want to turn the topic to uh, when violence is and is not needed. Uh, the question arises from, from your article, uh, could arguments for civil disobedience be used by the proponents and inciters of the Black Lives Matter violence of 2020? Uh, and is that a misinterpretation? Let's just read this little bit from your article. Although one may argue that acts of civil disobedience should always be non-violent in nature, Professor Moons does not entirely agree with this assumption. As noted by him, quote, it could be argued that there are some instances of societal injustice which could be remedied only through violent means, end quote. Further, it is possible to argue that coercive commands of the state that ultimately result in gross violations of fundamental legal rights are themselves more subtle forms of violence. I need to insert a caution here. Don't take any small part of what's said in this article or on this show as representative of the whole. Make sure you consider the whole article and the whole conversation that we're having tonight uh, before you get carried away and embarrass yourself by misquoting either uh, Professor Augusto Zimmerman, Professor Gabriel Munz, or any of the panelists on the show tonight. Uh, Professor Munz explains in this chapter, I'm continuing to read the article, uh, that the efficacy of civil disobedience is dependent on its rationality. As he points out, the requirement that civil disobedience should be rational is closely linked to an essential element in the legitimization of these extraordinary measures, namely that these, quote, acts are undertaken with the purpose of bringing about social change, end quote. He then proceeds to demonstrate how a commitment to rationality requires that the principles invoked as justification for civil disobedience must be balanced against the principle of regular obedience to validly enacted laws. This, according to him, is particularly important because human beings are naturally inclined to disobey rules with which they personally disagree. Uh, now, this is uh, something that I, I think is actually uh, a really important conversation because I am fully cognizant that the bad actors in the Black Lives Matter Corporation would claim rationality and necessity uh, against a tyrannical state. I wouldn't say that they would claim necessary the rationality because think about the postmodern approach taken by the left. You don't think they think they're being rational? I don't think they necessarily think that's so important. But all I want to say to you is that this cannot be decided arbitrarily, individually. Uh, there is something beyond it. Think about Martin Luther King, for instance. I mean, he disobeyed court orders and ended up in jail even. And then he had to explain why it's right to obey certain laws and it's not right to, to obey certain laws and to have and disobey others. I mean, that there is a difference between a law that deserves to be respected and a law that is unjust. Uh, but you have to have a, an element of reference here. You cannot just act in a, in a way that's totally arbitrary. And then, then he had to appeal to something that was very compelling namely their own, their own tradition of natural law and also the fact that he used the words of St. Aquinas and St. Augustine 
to justify his behavior. He said that um, uh, what he was doing was very easy to explain because um, he was fighting for the very tradition of the United States, that's a tradition of upholding the law and natural law, and that the government itself was violating this tradition and by not respecting a basic principle or element of the natural law, that, that's the idea of equality before the law. So what we have to bear in mind, then I mentioned the element of, rationa the ras oh, the element of rationality here, is that your argument needs to be reasonable and needs to be compelling enough and you should never strive to do certain things without carefully and ana careful analysis uh, so uh, if we appeal to this tradition and if you respect the idea that has brought about our constitutional values and, and principles then it is the right way to go but we have to handle this in a way that's a perfect manner so that we don't get the criticism that we will deserve if you do not do it properly. Well, that uh, there are ex what you said basically is there. There are two reasons why you end up with civil disobedience. The first is what you've described, where a government has created laws which are either unjust or unlawful. In which case, the civil yeah. disobedience represents society protesting an illegitimate government. The second, which is what Dave was talking about, which is Black Lives Matter. Now. Yeah. You can also have civil disobedience if you have a political force that wants to take power without going through the democratic process. And Black Lives Matter as a Marxist movement is the latter. It's a force that knows that it cannot win an election. And so it is engaging in uh, intimidation and uh, activist protesting as a way to try and coerce law without actually holding office. Absolutely. Uh, can I say something about this? Uh, Ali, you are in, this analysis. In, the, in a certain sense, the Marxists always believe that law is an instrument of oppression. So legality itself is something to be destroyed by Marxists. Marx didn't think that, as we believe, that the law is an instrument of uh, liberty or should protect our rights. Marx thought that law ceases to exist when we have the advance of the communist utopia. So in Marxism, it's the right thing to do to always rebel and always to destroy the legal system, which is a system created by a, a ruling class. And um, so to compare these two things is, 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 is in a certain sense, compare uh, different things altogether. Uh, there is no sense of legality, no sense of fighting for fundamental rights that the Marxists don't even believe they exist. In many ways, Marx himself was a sort of postmodernist because he believed that the rights are given or created by the social class and are used in many ways, even used as an instrument of oppression. Ellie, what do you think the argument would be for somebody who is not as um, willfully ignorant as a, uh, as a Black, Live, Black Lives Matter activist, but somebody who's sympathetic to them and thinking that there is real injustice being um, perpetrated by American law enforcement and around the world, uh, maybe. What do you think the argument is for them that says, you know, civil disobedience, which ends up being physical, uh, may be sometimes necessary, but that isn't one of those occasions and it's unequivocally undoubtedly wrong. How would you make that argument to somebody who is still intellectually honest but sympathetic towards the Black Lives Matter corporation? Well, the first thing that you do is ask them which law is unjust? What in particular have they found in the legal code which supports their argument? And of course, they will stop for a while because they won't be able to find anything because there have not been uh, racially discriminative laws in the US or Australia for quite some time. And even when they were in there, especially in Australia, they were not used. Um, the second thing you might, they might try and point to are some statistics. So this is circumstantial evidence uh, of inequalities. Um, and then you can go through that and you can detail more context to what was going on and a wider statistical base. Because the, the problem for the Marxists today is Marxists tag on to any um, uh, sort of trending social movement they can find and try and wrap it in 
to their push against authority because their desire, the first thing they have to do is to tear down authority. They don't really mind how they do it. They will pull from a thousand different angles and it doesn't have to be coherent as long as they create a struggle. Originally it was between class and now it's between all sorts of social orders, including and especially race. So usually facts are the first way to start chipping away uh, at the rational person inside of Marxist movement. The second is to ask them to analyse the movement itself. Look at the people who are leading the movement and what their goals are and ask them if they actually believe in the goals of the movement. Do they want to release all the criminals from jail? Do they want to tear down law and order? Do they want to create race-based taxations? Do they believe the fundamental principle of Marxism today, which is that you are guilty of the sins that other people committed, but you might share a skin colour with them but not even genetically relate, be related to them. So these are the things that you have to start asking um, the younger generations who are supporting these movements, because I can tell you for one, they don't know what these movements are. They have no idea what the history of the movement is and what the end goal of the movement is trying to create. And that's yeah. the big problem. They're only catching on to, oh yeah, that sounds like a great hashtag. It'll make a good protest. It'll look good on Instagram, but they don't know what the goal is or where it is heading and what that will mean for them. Mm -hmm. Do either of you think the uh, violation of natural freedoms uh, in Australia, in any of the states over the last year, has amounted to justification for violent resistance to the health directives? Look, uh, as I have to say it again, one thing is the philosophical discussion. There will be a point in time, as we had experienced in the past, when things become unbearable. And that's when there is a necessity to uh, go beyond the normal uh, element of action. We have, we have to always measure this in a very careful way, because uh, as long as we can still make a difference, as long as we can still, uh, we can still be heard by the elites, I think it's the inappropriate thing to do to uh, undermine a system like the one we have. But when you have a government that has itself undermined the system, when itself become oppressive and tyrannical, we have the right to resist. And that would be to protect the institutions and the rule of law, not to undermine them. So when you talk about Black Lives Matter, we are doing the opposite to what when we are doing the opposite of what they do. The idea mm. is that uh, we can have something like a protection of our fundamental rights and freedoms uh, to be cherished and to be protected. And if it's something that undermines this tradition, that undermines these fundamental rights, uh, becomes a reality that is beyond the limit of tolerance because our rights and freedoms and even our very life is under threat, uh, we have uh, then another right that's a natural right to resist. Uh, not saying that this should be exercised lightly. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, according to what Professor Moin says, is that this is also an element in our own tradition of constitutional law is the tradition of fighting for freedom and for fundamental rights in general. I, think I can quickly tag that on and finish it up if you like. Um, so what you were saying there is correct. And this is not the first time that Australia has been asked this question related to the medical mandate. So after the mm -hmm. Spanish flu, we already had a, the Quarantine Act and this was amended in light of what went on during the Spanish flu and we decided legally what the limitations of government would be if faced with another pandemic of this kind of scope. And the what we've seen happening recently is they've taken the Quarantine Act, which is now the Health Act, and it's a federal act, not a state act, and they have gone well uh, beyond what the scope was laid out in law, which was to protect the integrity and survival of the nation, not to protect individuals. There were thresholds written into that legislation about when it would be acceptable to take away people's rights and when it would not be. And these legal constraints that were placed upon this immense power to infringe upon the basic constitutional rights of the country, they have been exceeded without any politicians mounting the argument to the population or even bothering to ask anybody if they wanted to break what was already set down in law and decided was fair. So I think in answer to your question, the public are perfectly um, entitled to protest 
such a breach of an existing law that was settled after a pandemic once before. Interesting. I personally think that uh, churches and pastors should be getting legal advice and uh, planning a, a group civil disobedience action uh, in Western Australia and Queensland, uh, perhaps South Australia and definitely Melbourne, Victoria, um, when the inevitability of freedom of worship being um, transgressed once again, being, being arbitrarily rescinded by an authoritarian government, um, at the excuse and justification of one infected person in the state. It's happened in Western Australia recently. It's happened in Queensland recently. One person, a security guard or a cleaner, catches the China flu at a quarantine facility where obviously there's a high risk of infection. They call that a community transmission, and then they shut down an entire city, millions of people, not allowed to go to work, not allowed to go to church, not allowed to move around, uh, even doing stupid things like telling people to wear a face mask when they're alone in a car and driving. I think it's very sensible for people to be planning their uh, legal advice for possible civil disobedience and refusing uh, irrational, unreasonable, unscientific, disproportionate health directives. What are your thoughts? Look at the opinion to John Locke again, and he has a chapter in his second treatise distinguishing uh, a proper government that um, basically does what government should be doing, that's the upholding the law and protecting individual rights and freedoms, from a government that acts in a paternalistic manner, the paternal leader. And that's exactly what's happening in this country. I think people are confusing the role of the state with the, with the role of a, of a father or a mother. It's the whole idea that we have to be protected. This is how tyranny starts. I mean, this whole thing about we'll look after you, we'll, but the price will be the removal of your other freedoms. I mean, so there's this thing about um, people wanting too much to be protected. And even at the price of sacrificing their fundamental rights and freedoms. I think we are taking a very dangerous path here. And I'm not so surprised with the behavior of the ruling elites. I have never expected so much of them in this country. But what is really uh, astonishing me is the behavior of the ordinary citizen. There is something physically wrong with the mindset of our people here in Australia. I think they're becoming a bit of a uh, uh, servants of the state, and I actually, I believe it's connected with the erosion of Christianity, actually, because they have turned the state into God, uh, the, the almighty savior. So a person who dies at the age of 90 years old, it's all a great tragedy. Well, nobody is eternal. Everybody one day will pass away. There is too much of this focus on protection, nothing about liberty and freedom. I think we are taking a very dangerous path here. Uh, I think it's more simple than that. It's not even that they think the state is God. They have raised several generations to believe that they are special and that they are mm. um, unable to be harmed. They don't teach, certainly my generation, that we should expect problems to face us. We should expect there to be danger in our lives. And that it shouldn't have come as a shock to us that we ended up with a pandemic, considering we have about five or six serious pandemics a century. We were told that we would always be safe because we live in Australia. And once the government made that promise, they based their political futures on that promise and then they had to deliver on it. Otherwise, they were frightened that they would lose their position of, of power inside the government. And I think it's all to yeah. do with what governments have promised, which they shouldn't have, and a generation that doesn't know how to deal with conflict or with stress. And another thing I have to say, Alice, is that I, I had the impression that we, as a people, had a bit more of a sense of dignity and independence. The behavior of these uh, politicians here uh, is astonishing me because the more arrogant they behave, the more loved they become. Uh, the, the Western Australian Premier talks in a way that's utterly 
uh, unacceptable, in my opinion, because he thinks that he's the paternal ruler, dictating the others what to do. And the more he behaves in such an arrogant fashion, the more people tend to love him. And I'm actually quite astonished to see the behavior of my people here in Western Australia. I'm actually shocked. Well, I finally realized how history can happen. As someone who's a recent uh, reader of the revolutions, I never understood how people could be so foolish as to empower these yeah. uh, censorial politicians. And now I've seen it firsthand and fear has more power than people give it credit for. And until you're in exactly. it, you don't understand it. Mm. I couldn't agree more. Have we lost Dave? Is Dave out? Uh, here we go. I think we lost. It's just, oh, he's back. I was talking, but my camera was off, so my mic was off. Uh, i got to go, Dave. I, as I said, I'm in my brother's area. So. Awesome. Well, let's say goodnight, and thank you very much, everyone, for your uh, attention in the comments. Thank you, uh, Ellie and James McPherson, for being my co-hosts tonight, and our special guests, Colin Tinknell, uh, member of the Legislative Council in Western Australia, and Professor Augusto Zimmerman for his erudite insights and explanation of uh, law and, and freedoms and the constitution and uh, jurisprudence. It's, it's always uh, refreshing listening to you and, and having things explained and, and uh, pray that uh, the West Australian elections go well and hopefully people vote for liberty, freedom and, and right of center, or as Ellie Melly might say, touch wood, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, it was a pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. And we, we will uh, see you next week on Not Q&A, and hopefully we'll have some more, uh, as we lead up to the Western Australian election, uh, more insights into the options for the upper house over there. Uh, but that's it from the Good Source team here tonight, and we will see you next week. Now, I speak to you as a Catholic cardinal, Catholic bishop, uh, but at the heart of that, I'm a gospel Christian. We exist in all the denominations, and um, we believe, obviously, that Christ is, and his teaching and his redemptive activity at the center of everything, uh, but we believe that Christ's teaching has the last word. Uh, we are Democrats. We have a right to participate in society. Uh, we have a right to and an obligation to present our Christian point of view uh, because we contribute to human flourishing, I believe, uh, better than uh, any other uh, system uh, of values. So if we do follow his teaching, um, a lot of good things uh, happen and society is uh, much the better for it. So I'm delighted. Uh, you could have been asked to say a, a few words and uh, I firmly believe in what you're trying to do.